It's time for Supply Chain Now, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Heard around the world, Supply Chain Now spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good afternoon. Scott Luton and Greg White with you here on Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing great. It's been a big day of production here, right? And uh, we've got an old friend joining us. I say old friend, like a week old, but <laughs> but it's good to have him back. We Hey, we've got a home run show that we'll wrap yeah. up production today on. We've got two business and technology leaders doing big things, massive things in supply chain. And we're going to dive into the background, dive into uh, what they're doing today and where they're headed. So stay yeah. tuned for how we're going to be working hard to raise your supply chain leadership IQ. Yeah. Um, all right. So quick programming note before we get started, Greg, if folks enjoy today's episode, what kind of advice would typically give them? It's a tough question, Scott. Let me, uh, let me think about that a little bit. I would say go to YouTube or supplychainnowradio.com or wherever they get their podcast from. That's right. Not subscribe. necessarily in that order. <laughs> See how I changed up the order there? I do. Subscribe so you don't miss a single thing, including conversations like today, where we're going to be featuring, let's go ahead and bring in our featured guest, Tim Judge, President and CEO of Agilytics. Tim, good afternoon. How you doing, guys? Hey, Thanks for Tim. having me. Great to, have you, great to have you back. We love our repeat guests, and you are a hit. Uh, you and Shannon were a hit on the live stream, so great to have you. Um, and also, Nate Endicott, Senior Vice President, Global Sales and Alliances with our friends at Rate Links. Nate, how you doing? Good, Scott. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. It's been New a pleasure. Here, Scott. What's that? New guys here, so <laughs> take it easy on them. Well, hey, we, um, while Nate is new to the show, Rate Links is not. We really enjoyed yeah. uh, featuring Shannon on a couple of past shows, including last week's live stream, working and rubbing elbows with Corey and the whole team at Rate Links. And Nate, your ears have been burning because we have heard a lot of things uh, related to what, all the big things you're doing out in the marketplace. So great to have you here. Yeah. And looking well, forward to learning firsthand. Good stuff. All right. So uh, for starters, and you know, we want to dive into who you are first and, and where you're from and anecdote or two about your upbringing. So let's start with you, Nate. Nate, tell us wh where'd you grow up and you got to give us the goods on your upbringing a little bit. The goods. Well, I grew up in Southern California um, in Cyprus, actually. Oh. Uh, so I grew up right by the beach. I think I still have uh, sand in places that uh, sand doesn't belong <laughs> um, behind the ears and everywhere else. But I grew up as a sponger as a kid. So I used to uh, boogie board uh, Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, even during high school um, years, we'd go out about six miles from Huntington Beach and uh, grew up playing baseball in South Orange County and had an awesome upbringing. Uh, my dad was a music producer in LA wow. so why not it's either LA or I think Nashville right yeah uh, but I grew up in Southern California I actually grew up a couple doors down from Tiger Woods so that's the the famous uh claim to fame with with Tiger uh, the only two golf lessons I ever had in my life were with Earl at the Navy course and so we grew up had a fun um upbringing in SoCal and uh, spent a lot of time in the Midwest grandparents had a farm out there so I kind of got the best of uh, the Midwest in the winter and then got the heck out of there and enjoyed the beach all year round wow you were like ran on footloose right right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so that's cool man I've got so many follow-up questions Greg hit it uh, you better so, hit it before I do yeah <laughs> so for starters what type of music did your did your father produce mostly yeah so he was a, a a Christian contemporary Christian music producer uh, spent a lot of time in LA and obviously everywhere, but mostly it was writing string arrangements for you know guys like Amy Grant and BB and wow. CC Winans and uh, Steve Curtis Chapman, but kind of the contemporary Christian artist. And then obviously that pulled him into doing a lot of different type. Um, and then he was an executive vice president for a company called Maranatha music down in Southern California 
who produced a, a lot of the Christian artists and Christian music that is still being played, you know, mm. throughout the globe today. Well, those four that you mentioned are four of my favorites. Stephen Curtis Chapman, right. I don't think ever gets enough attention in particular. Good stuff. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, so much, that could be a whole episode. All right. Baseball, you mentioned what position. Let's go back a step before baseball. Can, do you think you can explain to us, Nate, why the lessons from Earl stuck with Tiger, but not you? Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think I did beat him a few times. Uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, yeah, exactly. I think. He might have a few more, right? You know what? He spent a lot more time behind a tree. Earl would take us out to the Navy course and he would basically dump a bucket of balls and would tell us, you know, until you can get in and three behind this tree, um, you know, we're not going anywhere. And wow. it was like, it wasn't like, Hey, let's work on your mechanics. It was forget mechanics. It's all about, you know, risk. And I think that'll, that ties great to even what we do today in business um, and helping organizations out. But it, it, definitely shape i love you know i'm a good four you know scramble player that's for sure i bet <laughs> that's awesome that's a great lesson man yeah. huge uh all right final question for you nate is baseball what position did you play yeah played up the middle uh in short and second closed a little in high school just they wanted a i guess I don't know, a little mix of strong arm but uh played up the middle and then went on and played at long beach state um, got drafted, played, you know, 18, 24 months, and then decided that uh, the, the family man that I was was very hard to uh, live out in the baseball world. So mm. who drafted uh, Who drafted you? Uh, Red Sox and then the Braves out of high school. So where'd you wind, where'd you wind up playing? Uh, double A with the Red Sox. And uh, so where was and that then, then? Back then it was, I want to say. Paul Tuckett. Pawtucket, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Man. I, Nate, I had no idea. Now, that's not fair in all the pre-show prep to hide some of this stuff. Some of this baseball and yeah, golf man. and music. It's it's fascinating. So, all double right. A is really glorious for anyone who doesn't know. That's $11,000 a year. A right. apartment over a garage and bologna sandwiches for a living. <laughs> yeah, with no mayonnaise. Right. right. <laughs> Sign me up. All Man, right, you you are earning your keep. I appreciate that's awesome. Mm. Yeah, good stuff. Well, Nate, looking forward to, to dive more into your Absolutely. role with rate links here momentarily. But we also want to get to know Tim Judge a lot better. Tim, we didn't get a chance too much with the live stream right. to really dive into your background. Uh, uh, so we're going to do that today. All right. So, <laughs> Tim, where are you from? And and share a couple of things about your upbringing. You know, you got to give us the goods there too. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, a Long Island, uh, New York native, um, grew up in Merrick, Long Island, or uh, aka uh, where Amy Fisher's from, um, or Ben and Jerry as well, Lindsay Lohan. Um, so we have uh, a long history of, uh, of interesting people. Um, we, uh, I grew up near the beach, right? So boogie boarding, uh, some surfing, um, you know, growing, growing up, uh, you know, so close to the beach is, is the thing I miss and being down in Atlanta. Um, great, great upbringing, um, you know, great parents. My, uh, my little sister just had a baby last week. So first time uncle, um, oh, congrats. Yeah, little, congratulations. Little, thanks. Thanks. So she's doing, she and the baby are doing great. Um, you know, COVID has been interesting, uh, going through big, big, big life changes like that, as I'm sure you guys uh, can attest. Um, you know, for, for Nate in baseball and golf, for me, it was basketball. So I was up at, at, on the courts at, you know, about 4 a.m., 5 a.m. every day playing. Um, and uh, shooting was my, was my, my, my thing. I uh, wasn't the best dribbler. I was fast and I could shoot. So three-pointers um, were and, and foul shots were, were my, my deal. Um, and did then, your, hey, did your range start when you stepped on the court? <laughs> oh, ab absolutely. Absolutely. And I got, I got in trouble many, a many a game for, for that as well, um, of where that range was. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's very, very exciting. Um, ended up going uh, to George coming down here for, for, for Georgia tech. Um, I've stayed in Atlanta, Atlanta ever since. And, uh, you know, um, music is probably, you know, he mentioned I, I've been in, um, it's been a little bit w a while, but growing up been in, uh, 
rock bands, play guitar. Um, you know, so been been in and out of different different bands my my whole life. Uh, you know, from a, from a music perspective, I also DJed um, in in college uh, as well. Spent two summers in in Ibiza, uh, Spain, DJing in, in front of some big crowds and, and the like. Um, those days are a little a little far far from here, far from now. But in a lot of ways, I'm sure. In a lot of ways. So I'm trying to figure What's out your DJ how to... name, Tim. Oh God, I had a, a lot. Uh, D, D, uh, DJ uh, Loki. Uh, uh, is probably the one that I use the most. So uh, did now watch somebody will somebody will know. Someone's googling it right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Hey, Sorry, did, man. did you play basketball at Georgia Tech? Uh no, intramural at, at uh, Tech. Yeah, I could have I could have uh, you know played um, you know potentially, um, but uh, but no, I didn't. Uh, Georgia Tech Division One was way 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 better than than I <laughs> than I could could compete with. Well, Greg, I very, very reluctantly want to pass the baton to you to dive into their professional journey. These are very interesting from a personal standpoint. Well, you know, what I think is important that we've learned here is, and, and you two should both know this, is that we are putting together a supply chain gang band. So, oh, awesome. so we always need musicians. We've got uh, Mike from Tosca. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, Brian, I can't name all the <laughs> Brian. Uh, we've got a drummer. Anyway, do you know Steve? Um, Steve? Steve Hopper, by any chance? I, yes, that name sounds yeah, familiar. Yeah, he's got he's got a band of uh, some supply chain guys, and he plays drums. Uh, so I just I was, it made me think of him. We need to book them for a live stream. Yes, and yep. we need some production help too. Yeah, some deal making help down there, Nate. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, and he, even two lessons from Earl is is uh, more more than I got, so I'm sure I can learn a lot. All right, all right. I'm sorry, guys. Let's look. We know you guys are professionals. At, at times, we're professionals. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. After you guys got done DJing and and surfing, eventually you had to get a job. So, uh, so Tim, let's start with you and tell us a little bit about your your professional journey and. You know, how, how you came to be where you're at and maybe, you know, kind of like a, a eureka moment or a pivotal moment or a particular, um, a particular uh, mentor that meant something, you know, that meant something meaningful to you. Yeah, yeah, I, I, absolutely. I appreciate, uh, appreciate the, the question, Greg. So I, um, I came down, I had no idea what, you know, I knew I was good at math and, and engineering sounded like something that was, uh, was good for, for, for people that were analytical. I started in computer engineering or electrical engineering and took a lot of CS classes and realized quite, you know, quickly that that wasn't, wasn't for me. I don't, I didn't have the attention span. I had roommates that can code for 24 hours a day and absolutely loved it. And yeah. I have nothing but respect for, for those individuals realized very, very quickly that wasn't for me. So switched to kind of the industrial and in system in engineering uh, side. And I had some really good professors that I think were, were definitely mentors, both as an undergrad um, and IE, as well as uh, for, my, for my MBA at, at Georgia Tech as well, um, that kind of, you know, sh you know, shed light on, on statistics in, in innovative ways. Um, you know, I had Dr. Dr. Jane Ammons, who was, I had for three statistics classes, um, you know, as an undergraduate that was really, um, you know, really good and made, and she taught some supply chain too, and made it kind of fun and interesting why it's important. So that, that was kind of always in, in the back of my mind. Um, and then some great, uh, professors, um, you know, in my, in my MBA as well, that kind of gave me that a little bit more of that entrepreneurial spirit and what it's like to start a company. Greg, I know you can, you can attest to that, um, business plan competitions and, you know, not only how to design the perfect product, but maybe just as importantly, how do you market that that product or service? Um, you know, to get to get people excited and um, and the like. So a lot of that was was new to me at the time. So a lot of great mentors um, there. Um, and then when I graduated from tech as an undergrad, I, I started at a, a, a company which is a small kind of knit 
um, group in Vinings uh, called Geocom TMS. And I worked with, uh, you know, gentlemen, Chris Russell and Robert Cleesey and a lot of supply chain guys. And it was really neat because you would have the CEO and director of marketing and, you know, VP of, you know, solutions and, and your VP of sales all within 10, you know, feet of each other. You know, and I'm a 22 year old kid, you know, just starting his career, getting to, you know, mentored by, um, you know, people in supply chain that have been there for 30 years. And not only that, but in different areas, right? Yeah. Um, and get a little bit of everything. Um, so they ended up being sold to, uh, to Red Prairie, then became JDA, now Blue Yonder. Uh, I ended up going, because um, I was in, involved in a lot of the pre-sales and, and demoing activity, ended up going to work at Manhattan Associates, um, which was the largest end of my career. It was about seven years. So predominantly in their warehouse management uh, product, you probably heard of their Manhattan's WMS. Um, so I got involved in that. My first project was for FEMA um, right before Hurricane Katrina. Really? Um, wow. so, yeah. So... I could probably, uh, you know, bite, you know, you know, talk your ear off about some of the, the, the stories from, from that project alone, but I really understood the importance of supply chain then and, you know, what, what happens if we don't get, you know, products like water and, and, and meals to, mm. to, to hurricane victims and even though it had absolutely nothing to do with our software. Um, you know, working with, with teams and government to be able to track packages and, and, and stuff like that was, was really cool. Um, so kind of stepped in, into supply chain and then seven years later went and got my MBA. Um, I worked at, you know, supply chain consulting um, company um, for three years um, in Vista, um, kind of led the uh, oh, yeah. you know, director in their supply chain solutions practice. So big implementations um and also you know i love love manhattan but being you know working for a software vendor is is different than you know kind of in the consultancy um side of things and what you can do with customers um just the nature of it was a good experience um and then i've also done a couple couple startups in between and and things like cognitive computing and neural networking um it was kind of ahead of its time um and what i learned from that is just how important timing is to your entrepreneurial suits, right? Even having a great idea that everybody needs, if it's not quite at the right time, um, it's it's still like an uphill uphill battle. Um, and then six years ago, I started Agilytics, and um, you know we're we're really really uh, kind of a, I think a unique culture. Um, just had four new uh, college hires start this morning, um, as they start yeah awesome. as they start Congrats. their career. Thanks. Uh, it's tough to find that. good talent these days and, and to find four and hire four. That's a great win. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Scott. And, you know, and, and I think in this, in this current climate and environment, um, you know, to be able to, to do that, um, you know, we feel very, very fortunate, right. Um, you know, as I kind of said, you know, maybe a little bit uh, attested to on the last call is you know, very fortunate that a lot of companies out there are struggling, as you mentioned, struggling to find talent, struggling to, pivot and change their business practices with the, you know, with everything going on with COVID. Um, so definitely, definitely fortunate and, and kind of rolling with the punches a little bit. Outstanding. Wow. That that's outstanding. I'm, I'm interested from all of that. Seems like you've had quite a few kind of pivotal moments, but I mean, can, does one in particular stand out as, something that really changed your perspective or shifted your direction? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because they, they don't always line up with what you what you think would be. Um, I'll tell you real quick, I was at, um, uh, I was doing, and you guys, everyone on this call, I think can attest is a really, really difficult, hey, I've been up, a you know, I worked 120 hours this week. It's 3 a.m. I'm at a distribution center. We can't ship product, right? It's three days from Christmas. Everybody is absolutely exhausted and irritable. And like, why did we get into technology? Why are we, why, why is this so complicated? And I, there was a warehouse manager that I was, I was working with and we're trying to roll out, um, you know, different reports so we can kind of see what's going on. And there's this huge backlog of, of work and, and fill rates down and, um, and everything. And he's like, we spent millions of dollars on these uh, software solutions. Why can't I manage my warehouse 
effectively? Why, why is this so difficult? And I didn't have a good answer for him. I said, you're right. It shouldn't be that difficult. And um, that was kind of the pivotal moment where, where I'm like, you know what? There's so much opportunity and technology and just quality people out there that it doesn't need to be that difficult, you know? And I didn't have an answer at that time. I don't know that I have a full answer now, but, um, but that was kind of the pivotal moment to say, yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, technology is, is moving so fast and how do I connect that technology um, or technologies and people to, to solve business problems so that we can, you know, manage our transportation and our warehousing and our ordering and, um, and it doesn't need to be that tough. So I might have been that guy, except in a different place. So. <laughs> oh, I thought you mentioned the warehouse maybe manager. Before. Like, you look familiar. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey, kid. Uh, maybe before your time, but uh, a company that I worked for in Phoenix was one of the first to implement PKMS mm. from Manhattan. And frankly, a bit of a pivotal moment for me, too, because it took so much consulting and it took so much fidgeting is what I called it at the time. And I just thought there has to be an easier way to do this. Um, and there is, and a lot of companies like you guys have gotten to that point. And we talked to a lot of companies that have frankly changed the paradigm for how people integrate technology. So I, I think yeah. that's a really valuable pivotal moment, if that's what you want to call it. Yeah. That, yeah. the why isn't it much easier? Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And I think it, and it exposed to, you know, Greg, just the, the importance of data, right? So you can have the best technology in the world, but if you, you said it on the last all right, garbage in, garbage out. If, yeah. if you have the, you know, the, you don't have the right data and you don't, you know, configure it right. Um, you could have a great system, right? Um, and it's, but it's taken a look at, uh, you know, the importance of the data and, and are we getting out of the system what we, what we expect to get to be able to make make decisions, right? Um, and what I found is a lot of the transactional systems are great at capturing information, right? I'm scan this this pallet, it'll tell me to put it away. Um, but taking a step back is what does that mean? How are we performing? How, how many you know staff should I bring in today? You know how does how do am I meeting our customer demands? It's not yeah. What do I use it for? What do you what use do I use it for? for? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's incredibly powerful. That's where bridge solutions that that take that data and turn it into something valuable become so critical, especially in this day and age when you have to be so. Oh my gosh, I almost said agile, but I guess I should <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah, I mean you do right. Yeah. I mean you have to be. No, you, you have to be agile. You have to be responsive. Absolutely. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That I mean that. Um. You know, that's just, uh, it, it's great to hear how people come up because it helps us understand the perspective that you have on the world and how you approach it, right, as a founder. Yep. All right, Nate. Good stuff. Should we? Wow. Should, um, yeah, man, top that, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, to me, coming out of playing ball, I mean, I had to figure out, you know, hey, what am I going to do with my life? When I sat down for college, they asked, I want to be an architect and I love drawing and, you know, design. And I sat down and the, you know, the administ ad, the administration people that in the admissions office for the baseball team, they sat me down and said, Hey, what do you want to do? And I told them, and they said, well, where's your uh, portfolio? And I, <laughs> I just laughed. I'm like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about a portfolio? I mean, I have a bat and a glove. What do you I mean? I have like, golf clubs in the back of my trunk. And so right on the spot, I said, hey, the, uh, the tutor for the baseball team nudged me and he said, just say communications. So I said, okay, I'll do communications. <laughs> so that, that's really, I mean, you know, my bent, um, just the way I'm, I'm, I'm a big believer in you can't put in what God left out. And um, you got to stay focused on your gift sets and leverage your strengths. You still work on your weaknesses, but coming out of, you know, playing ball, I had to figure out I hadn't graduated yet. So I'm like, man, I just want to go spend time with kids. And I was a youth pastor for a couple of years. Um, and like, Hey, I'm going to go figure this thing out. I still thought maybe I should go back and play ball. I, I started uh, my own baseball, um, hitting, um, and fielding 
kind of lessons and academy it was called in the beginning the the big innings where it started but oh, never ends. Oh, look at you. And um, had like 75 kids out here in the Valley in Phoenix and quickly realized that, uh, you know, just like data centers in some ways going away because of the cloud, it was like fields were going away quickly. And um, I was forced to figure out, okay, hey, I got to do something different. I started my own marketing organization. It was called Indicot Creatives. Nothing creative about the name, but I had kind of a, a, a name out there already with some some brands that I was helping and quickly realized that I could outsource um, some work and get a lot of help. And so I created a team in the Philippines and um, had a couple project managers and started just doing biz dev work and creating, being an entrepreneur. Learned a lot from my grandpa. Uh, he passed away, I don't know, a couple months ago, but was 99 and uh, was really the guy that shaped me as far as business and entrepreneurship and how to treat people and live it, you know, never, you never want a day to go by where you owe someone an apology and just simple things in business and how to take care of customers. But that creative side of me um, on that marketing side, I kept running into, you know, technology companies. And one was a global freight audit payment provider. And they approached me and said, Hey, come and help us. And, uh, I was well behind the years in the industry. I was really young and I'm like, man, you know what? This will be great. They had a horrible SEO presence. They really didn't have a website. They, you know, we had just won a huge deal with, uh, with, with HP and they said, Hey, six, you got to outsource 60% um, and you have six months to do it. So we went and I had already had that globalization kind of mind frame right. mindset. And so we quickly opened an office in the Philippines, opened an office in Costa Rica, opened an office in Prague. And then, nice. um, and, you know, I think we, and then in the air Scotland, so we had the global presence um, quickly realized that uh, this, the supply chain world is, is big and freight on and payment is a teeny, 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 tiny piece. Mm. And it's the piece around the invoice. And it's like, man, I can't, you know, I've got scars too um, around just having discussions on how do you help your customers go solve problems when you just have invoice data. So I spent many years there helping them globalize and ended up taking over sales and, and marketing. Hey, Nate, uh, real quick. When, yeah. When you, as you were expanding globally, yeah. give, give us an idea in terms of the time frame because you know, nowadays it's probably a little bit easier to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. But I get the impression this was a, a few years back when it was more challenging. Yeah, I would say it was between 05 and 08, mm. 07, 05 to 07. And uh, it was easy to, it was hard to find good people. Um, obviously, just with my background in, in ministry in the nonprofit world, I'm like, okay, you know what? It's, we're human beings and we all have our flaws and human beings are, you know, messed up and we're all wacky in our own ways. So let's go find some good people in each, you know, area. And so we went out and tried to find a kind of a general manager, uh, you know, and a couple that had the same values that we shared from an executive team and, you know, tried to help instill our values in them. And then they, they kind of knew everybody. So we tried to navigate the, the political side in each of those regions um, and then try to just find good talent and good people. What we realized is a lot of our customers were in those areas and to, in order to get that logistics mind frame, um, and expertise, you kind of had to go and, you know, start hiring customers and people. And that, that's kind of how we kind of built uh, those reasons. But yeah, it was in a time where uh, you were doing a lot of Skype calls and, you know, bandwidth was bad and it was hard to communicate and right. people didn't have fluid hours. It was really very hard, you know, stops and um, customer service wasn't the best back then. But yeah, so after global, you know, globalizing that company, um, you know, I, I moved on to another opportunity where, uh, my dad always, you know, kind of told me, he said, Nate, you know, go to the place, whatever you want to do in life in your next venture, go to the place that's doing it the best. And so I've kind of always put on that hat and, um, go learn from the best. So if I was going to, you know, do podcasts, I'd probably come and sit in your backyards and hang out with your family. Wow. That is an unpaid but, uh, endorsement. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Thanks, but no, I, it's, I, it's try to instill that in my kids and even in our culture at rate links, it's like, Hey, look, you know, you guys have an awesome opportunity here and we do feel, um, uh, in, in privileged of what we do, but being able to do that back then when I did it, I chose to go to another, you know, freight audit payment company that I thought was kind of on that forefront 
and spent a couple of years there. And I mean, I quickly realized that, you know, freight audit is dead. You know, it's like, you know, what's the, you know, what's, what's good about, uh, you know, short paying an invoice and creating problems for the carrier and the customer. And it's like, there's no good in that. And how do you, you, you create an adversarial relationship and it's like, Hey, all this data is out here. How do we go leverage that? Um, I, I then went and took a, another role, which was kind of like a part ownership role in a company that was based out of Europe and uh, had about a year and a half stint with them. I was the only guy in the U S won some big deals for them and thought, man, let's open an operation here and we can do it. And then it, it kind of hit me. I woke up one day and I'm like, man, you know what? I need to stick to my core. Uh, I had just had our uh, fourth and final kid. Um, and he was going through heart surgeries. We found out that when he was a little boy, right in the Euro, 28 weeks old, he had a, what they called uh, aortic stenosis, but mm -hmm. it was severe and um, he needed to have something or he was going to die. And so we, wow. by the, uh, the grace of God and some data and some smart guys that are super smart um, in Boston, they were able to do surgery on my son inside my wife's belly, basically save his life. Wow. So wow. going through that and trying to open up an operation in the U S I'm like, you know, what? this, I, I need to, you know, hit, hit the reset and I want one more reset. And so I remember waking up when I was in the, uh, Boston and I woke up and um, had a couple emails from some RFPs that we had participated in. And basically it was one of those emails as I know, Tim, we've all gotten that says, you know, Hey, thank you so much for participation, but we decided to go with another direction. And, every time you get that, you have a choice to either, you know, not respond or pick up the phone and try to still engage with the relationship. And I've always thought, thought I'm going to engage. So I picked it up and they had gone with rate links. And so I'm like, man, I got to figure something out. Uh, so I sit in the hospital, I link, sent a LinkedIn message to Shannon Valancourt, our president. And I said, Hey, I, I don't know if you check your LinkedIn. Uh, but if you do, I'd love to have a discussion. I'm at a, a critical point in my career. And I'm, I'm excited to go do something different. This is where I kind of feel like the freight audit world is at. I'm looking for, you know, a company that has a lot of data mindset. That's data first approach. And uh, I recently lost a few deals to you. Can we talk? And he says that I'm the only guy he's ever responded to on LinkedIn, but he responded <laughs> because I was in Phoenix and he wanted to open up office in Phoenix. And so we talked. And so two awesome. days later we spent, I don't know, a couple hours on the phone talking about the industry uh, talking about scars and, and just future mindset on, Hey, how can we go build something? If the industry is 10 years behind, what are we going to do? And so I think that was a, a moment in my career where I, I had to think about, do I want to just go be a part of something again? Or do we want to go be a part of something that's, you know, really a part of something. And, and so I, I hit that pause button. Re he flew me out to Madison and met with um, the other owner of the company, Frank and hit it off. And, um, I haven't, haven't looked back, but I think that was one moment in my career. Uh, and I've had many where I can always hear those mentors and those people that I've placed myself around kind of ask me that question. Hey, are you with the right people? Um, you are who, you know, you become who you hang out with. Um, you know, are, are you, you mm -hmm. know, making strides to become better? Or are you just stagnant? And um, that was, I think when I decided about six and a half years ago when I joined Ratelinks. There, wow. you know, Greg. There's so much to dive into. Uh, I thought we were, I thought we were uh, doing something on the personal side, establishing the personal background with both Tim and Nate here. But the the professional background is so, um, uh, can, it, it, a lot of contrast there between Tim's and Nate's. But you know what? The beauty of that is that in supply chain, especially in supply chain in 2020, you know, we need a wide variety of skill sets, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's something for everybody in, in global supply chain. So I love, and, and Nate, I really appreciate um, uh, your approach and, and, and kind of your journey and how you, and, how, and really how you shared it. There, I think I had a pivotal moment there or two. <laughs> Agreed, yeah. <laughs> and, right. I mean, you can't put in what God left out. I, I think that is a, an important recognition to understand what your gifts are. That's right. So, Right. And to roll with that, whatever it is, like you said, never tr stop trying to improve yourself. Yep. Yeah. But if you start with those core strengths and you went back to that at some point as well, right. Yep. That sense of focus is important. So 
what we want to do next and by the way nate really sorry to hear about your grandfather um no i appreciate uh, I, it i'm sure there, there's a there's several numerous conversations we could talk about some of the lessons learned there but yeah. we'll revisit that but uh all, all the best to his family sounds like he, he lived a really full and rich life and and uh, his legacy is alive and well so um all right so what we want to do next uh tim and nate is we want to we want to dive into each of your organizations and what they do and your role right and then we're going to uh go into a really neat partnership between the organizations but for starters let's, let's, let's set the table a little bit more here so tim starting with you Tell us about what uh, Agilitics does. Yeah, sure. You know, quite simply, I, I tell um, my friends, family, uh, employees, we're, we, we like to think of ourselves as, this, as the supply chain data scientists. Well, what, is, what does that mean, right? Is, is really connecting the dots between data um, and, and operations. Because, you know, you see everyone will tell you just all the, you know, the data issues, um, you know, as data gets, gets, we get more and more from a volume perspective and variety and, and the big data challenges, it's just going to intensify. Um, so being a company, a trusted advisor uh, for our customers to be able to really um, enable them to leverage that data, um, you know, for, for true insights and, and making decisions. Um, and getting more uncomfortable with those latest technologies, um, you know, as things do do accelerate, which we which we know that they will. Um, so bringing that domain expertise, both in supply chain data and IT, um, kind of together, I, I like to call it the supply chain unicorns um, the, a group because <laughs> it is kind of like the jack of all, of all trades. It's hard to find those skill sets in one person. So we do a tremendous amount of cross training um, and, and staying on top of those technologies. Um, and thankfully, we do have great, great partners and, um, and industry experts um, like yourselves on, on, on this call um, that really help facilitate that. Um, and then really, um, you know, implementing, you know, best in class analytics for our customers um, and then, you know, making sure that they can self, they can sustain um, those skills. So sometimes that's helping them build those teams, doing some of the heavy lifting up front um, on a variety of technologies um, so that ultimately, um, you know, they're not beholden to us. They can kind of run on their, their own and grow and then we can go and, and focus on more complex problems and keep, uh, keep all our young staff uh, motivated and, and challenged and, and happy. Mm. Work yourself out of a job. That's a work great yourselves approach. out of a job, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the the supply chain unicorns team, it, the herd keeps getting bigger and bigger. Y'all have grown quite a bit, at, as evidenced with the the four hires you've made here lately. Um, as founder, president, CEO, where do you spend your time? I am the chief psychiatrist. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I, I think it's, you know, it, it, and Greg alluded to it on, on our last call. I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting to me is you're, you're doing a little bit of, of everything. So it's always at the beginning of the day, okay, well, how do I put the first things first and then, and then go tackle that, right? So, um, you know, and that changes, you know, from priorities on, on my time and even within, <laughs> within the business, you know, kind of day to day. Um, so kind of taking a step back and, and really focusing, you know, on, on that. Um, if I err on one side, it's, it's the people, um, just because I think, um, building the right team. And if you treat your, your team, right, um, and give them the tools that they need to do, um, you know, they'll go find the customers, your customers will be, or will be happy. Um, you know, you're, 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 you're learning, you're growing, they're helping each other learn, they're helping each other you know, where allow you to kind of, to, to, to kind of step, step away and, and get out of their way. Um, and we've, we've done a really good job, I think, of hiring really, really bright, hungry, you know, I would say the hungle, hungry, humble, and smart, right? The smart's a little bit of a given. Georgia Tech and schools like Georgia Tech do a lot of the hard, hard work for, for us by, by, you know, making sure, but it also means emotional intelligence and, right. Um, you know, and, and those types. So we, we focus on the soft skills, the uh, even more so than, than the hard technology skills. And then humble, super important, because if you get, you know, big, big egos and, and, and that, that 
completely kills it. You need to be open to new ideas and, and, and ideas. And then hungry, right? Making sure I, I take a hungry, really hungry person um, with less degrees and less experience any day of the week, right? What that, that fire, they have to be able to move fast. They have to move fast for our customers um, and seek out, you know, value. And, and that requires kind of that, that hungry work ethic and, and passion. So, mm-hmm. um, so yeah, most of my time is, is enabled to make, honestly, just making sure that they have what they need um, and then connecting them to, you know, to the right certifications and right um, learning and right organizations where they can continue to learn. So then when our customers come to us and they expect us to, you know, understandably understand both the market and the technologies and what they're doing, um, that they can be confident that we're making the right decisions on, on, and suggestions on their behalf outstanding uh, and there's so much more there but nate let, let's keep setting the table let's talk about rate leaks uh, you know some of our audience uh, may remember some of the r- recent episodes that we that we uh, sat down with shannon valancourt and learned more about the model but let's refresh our memory what what does rate links do and where do you spend your time yeah absolutely uh it's 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 i think hard sometimes when someone comes up and says hey what do you guys do because there's a lot and i think uh when you boil it down, we really help, you know, organizations ship, track, and pay less for freight. And um, we are a logistics technology, uh, you know, and services company. And, you know, we have a TMS. Uh, we have freight out and payment. And then we also one of the top providers in the track, global track and trace world. And so I think, you know, it's, it's trying to help organizations, you know, uh, gather all this data you know, you got to collect it. And then it's integrating all this data together, the shipping data, tracking data, invoice data. And then how, how do you help them, you know, go use it? Um, but there's a, a lot of, uh, I, I, we're data first company. So everything we do is really around data and helping our shippers, our customers leverage data to go impact um, the bottom line and go impact SGNA. I'll go impact EBITDA and it's, um, yeah, I, th- I think the three big areas that we typically help customers around is, you know, cash service and cost. And mm-hmm. I always like to sit down and have that conversation with them because if, if you really ask them, you know, peel back the onion and it's, you know, make it personal. They our best customer is someone that comes to us that has pain, not just looking for a product. Um, cause if you don't fix the right problem at the right spot, you're going to get replaced. And so we, we have, I think we've lost one customer in the history. I, I think one of the things that's, that's good about what we're able to do is help them drive the, you know, and understand that we can impact, you know, their bonus in some ways. And so a lot mm-hmm. of our trans logistics supply chain chiefs, you know, supply chain officers that have latched on, you know, to rate links, um, you know, always are sending us thank you notes and hey, I appreciate it because they, they really do. They take you, you know, customers that like you, they take you wherever you go and uh, they, they don't miss their bonus because mm. they're leveraging data in the right way. Mm. It's a powerful incentive for sure. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I love how, how some of the, the inter, interlap between the two organizations and what you mm. do is really, you know, that powerful spotlight to, to um, provide visibility in many ways, which is, you know, it's been the rage for years. It will be uh, just a bigger emphasis based on the 2020 challenges moving forward, but, yeah. but, but also making sure it's the right data. It's the accurate data. Um, you know, uh, all the data sources are playing nice in the sandbox. So many critical uh, elements there that allow organizations to move faster. And, and Nate, as you put it, ship track and pay less for freight. I love simplicity is such an underrated quality in 2020. Yeah. All right, so Nate, uh, one final question about you and Rate Links before we talk into talk about this pretty exciting partnership is where do you spend your time? Yeah, I mean, I head up sales uh, in alliances, and uh, so I get to spend most of my time um, on that side, also the marketing side, but uh, helping customers and our client engagement teams, you know, get the most value out of you know our solution. Uh, again, the KPIs and metrics that we provide to our customers are helping them you know, impact business in such a way that it, it means something to them personally too. So it's, um, you know, from the front of the sale all the way through 
and uh, on the Alliance side, just helping our partners, uh, which we're obviously excited about the Agilitics partnership, but helping our partners gain uh, the most value out of our solution as well. And uh, so I spend most of my time on, you know, the sales side and then just as important as the partnership side as uh, that's a big piece of, you know, our revenue and where we're going in the future. Love it. All right. So let's talk about rate links and agilitics, Greg. There's some big news here, right? <clears throat> yeah, so, I'm dying to know, <laughs> I mean, what, what kind of leverage these two companies together creates, right? Like Wonder Twin Powers activate. I, so, I was thinking that exact same thing. <laughs> All right. So, Tim, let's go back to you. So, uh, yeah. tee things up. How, how are we going to be working together here? Yeah, I, I think, you know, for, from Agilitics perspective and just for, you know, quick context, when we, you know, got, got our start, it was very much visibility. You know, how do we use better visualization and, and dashboards and real-time alerts to manage our, our DCs or our transportation network, um, you know, combined with some of the things we're doing in, you know, planning and design. And, you know, now I think the the there, there's an opportunity because, you know, there's blurring of, of responsibilities of functions within the supply chain. Um, and, and that's breaking down barriers and walls uh, for those teams to work together. There's, I think there's um, blurring of responsibilities across IT and operations. And that combined with everything we talked about in data is now is a really good time to really focus in on how do we truly provide better end-to-end -end visibility um, with the technology, the availability of the data, um, and what really the one area it was, hey, let's let's look for a partnership that already gets you know real-time updates, has relationships with carriers, um, to 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 get the speed of implementation and speed to value that our customers are really are really looking for, right? Um, so how do we sidestep some of the bureaucracy, some of the slowdown, some of the getting access to the data and tap into um, with the company? Um, so provided their technology, their relationships, their data combined with our solutions expertise and, and getting insights from, from that data, combining it with inventory and, and order demand and all the other types of data elements that we, um, that we pull and, and aggregate and cleanse and harmonize for our customers. Um, it's, it's like a match made in heaven because now we can go to a customer and say, hey, well, what is a control tower, right? It's the ability to, you know, to sense, to get the right data, to, you know, to get it in one place, to enable advanced mathematics and, and things like prediction and, you know, what to do next. Um, but if you talk to any of those customers, their challenge is always, is always data. The second thing is, um, is that rate links, you know, in talking with different companies that have had challenges in the transportation visibility space, it usually comes down to one of two things that I see, and I love you guys' opinion. One is, uh, is the carrier onboarding process, right? So having done that with carriers and, and having those relationships in, in place. Um, the second thing is data quality is, hey, we implemented this and, and we're not trusting the, the insights and the ability and, and talking with Shannon and Nate and knowing that data quality is number one on their list and they get it and that's where their focus is, um, you know, made us feel comfortable that, hey, this is a good partnership with our combined, you know, focus and obsession. I'll even go as far as to say obsession with um, ensuring data is, is clean and relevant and timely. So, um, to enable all the other things customers want to do, because with, without that, you're you're hosed before you get started. Love that. Love yeah, that. Yeah, and that session. is critical, right? I mean, right now, one of the biggest issues in the industry for accomplishing what your clients, your joined clients, are are trying to do, is the availability of data or the timeliness of that data, right? Yep. All right. So, uh, Tim did a very nice job setting the table there, Nate, about the partnership. But what, what would you add from Rate Link's perspective? I mean, I think- and Why did you do business with this guy? Right? <laughs> <laughs> I kept seeing him in the, you know, the gym at all the Marriott's and uh, eating <laughs> healthy breakfasts. So I'm like, he definitely understands data quality and the need for speed. So, no, I think, um, you know, one thing that, you know, partnership, a partnership, just to have a partnership is a waste of a partnership. It's a waste of time. And um, Shannon and I have always, you know, f from a vision strategic standpoint, we always want to partner with guys that it's a lasting partnership and it's truly solving 
a spot in the market uh, that is helping, you know, customers. And I think one of the things that it's just known out there, um, and it's one of the reasons why I went to rate links. It's one of the reasons why we've partnered um, is, you know, I think what Coke done, but also just business as business. I mean, people go and source and procure, you know, a TMS, then they procure a free audit payment provider, and then they procure a, or source a tracking provider. And there's three different silos, none of which really actually go and fix the true, true, true root cause issue of data. Right. And then you have this whole left side, you know, the order demand and inventory and all this other data, and it's all out there. And it's um, people throw, you know, people at problems and um, when there's a computer. And so it's like, we, if you can eliminate exceptions and you can drive people to focus, I just think companies have realized that you know, having data silos has crippled their decision making. And I think that's, uh, you know, why I'm really excited about this partnership. And I, I know that we've talked about it on the last call, but, you know, what the data quality brings, and it's really the uniqueness of rate links, I, I believe, is, you know, being able to deliver accurate, complete, and timely data. And with that, and, and Tim's team and what they're doing, bringing all this together, uh, you know, you don't have to go buy a, you know, a two to $5 million, you know, control tower hub. That's got all these different apps in it. And, and the days for, you know, a time to value a quick ROI are now and going and hitting your initiatives is now. And how do you do that now? And that, that's why we're excited about partnering, uh, bringing them into our, our customers, us going to their customers and then together what we're going to be able to do. Cause this whole control, you know, big data was a, a, a big word back then. A big buzz, and it's like they were people talking about like, you know, lowercase data, little tiny, tiny data. Right. So it's how do we, you know, quickly help organizations um, go out and impact their bottom line and give them invisibility um, to be able to go make decisions and then be able to, I think, measure and monitor uh, what they're doing so that they're not having to, you know, go out and spend months and months to develop, you know, some modeling exercise or it's, you know, how do you <laughs> bring that, you know, time to value shortened? Cause it's, you got to quickly re, you know, hit repeat and uh, you want to make sure that you know the unintended consequences mm -hmm. before you go make any business decision that's going to impact potentially your job. Well, you know, you are preaching to the choir especially the one Greg White. He, uh, Greg, I know one of the things you love talking about is how the, the days have largely gone for the 24-month yeah. you know, implementations of technology. So, so based on what you heard Tim and Nate share, Greg, about this partnership and about what it will add to the market and their, and, uh, their clients, what stands out to you? Well, so I have, I have my own idea, but I would love to pose this question to you all first. So put on your Socrates hats <laughs> and think philosophically, because as I was having this discussion, or as you were each sharing your part, I was thinking, what would my reaction be? What would I hope to accomplish with this joined effort of the two of you? So I'd love to pose that question to you. What do you hope is happening back at your customers' headquarters or offices based on what you two have put together here. I mean, I know you expect them to be um, cursing, cursing joyfully, but, but I mean, <laughs> what, what, uh, you know, what, what result <laughs> and what um, feeling, what uh, sense of relief, what pains relieved do you hope that they're getting out of this? Tim, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. So I, I would say, you know, if my, our, our customers, uh, at least the direct relationships that we have probably here, you know, are probably sick of hearing me <laughs> tell them that there's, you know, there's, there's an easier way and getting them, you know, to that, um, you know, to that next step. Um, I think that they, they would, they would say, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done because, you know, there's still a lot of companies out there that really have very separate, transportation groups, very separate inventory groups, very, you know, um, separate sales organizations and marketing, some of what are coming together. Um, and there's been huge strides, right, to, to bring that together. 
Um, one of the things that I think is, is, is really where it's going to become very um, known, obviously COVID helped a lot with that, un understandably, because a lot goes into, you know, trying to figure out what's the best path to take after something like COVID changes our demand completely, right? And, and how we service that, that demand differently. Right. Um, the second thing is I would look to traditional processes like SNOP, SNOE, SIOP, um, uh, total cost to serve, any, any problems you're trying to solve that require, you know, if you think about freight and um, inventory and marketing um, and merchandising, uh, working together and need their data and that that's expanding more and more of those use cases um, are gonna be like oh shoot this is this is this this is could be a really cool partnership because we're bringing together best in class trans visibility with inventory and and how do you make decisions without that how do you sit in an SNOP meeting and not take vendor lead time into consideration and understand transportation else you're you're just you're just kind of guessing right so bringing that all together um, is going to increase the accuracy of the data. And, and it's very difficult to do with one platform um, because there's, there, it's a frag, most of those markets are extremely fragmented, you know, and Greg, we talked about that is there's, yeah. don't get me wrong, there's best in class solutions in each of those areas, you know, but who's helping to bring that together to make those holistic decisions, uh, you know, across the supply chain. It's not going to be a, one specific vendor that's focused on an, an, an area, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't be, you can't be the merchandising guy pointing the finger at the logistics guy who's pointing right. the finger at the inventory guy. You've got to break down those silos and not just do that, but also create more than just communication, but collaboration and back and forth information that allows each to improve the other's practice. That's right. So Nate, uh, what, what's your take? What are your customers? What, what are they going to be singing the praises of, with it when it comes to this new partnership? Yeah, I mean, I, I get excited for our customers around just the forecasting side. I mean, I think, you know, we, again, we typically are bringing in that trans freight data, that order shipment tracking and invoice. And uh, everybody always asks us, you know, like, hey, can you bring in the inventory side? You know, can we, how do you help us on the, you know, demand planning or, you know, um, order demand? And it's like, you know, this now enables us to be able to extend ourselves to, you know, be able to collaborate them and with them and solve a problem. And it's, uh, we always are asking them, you know, Hey, why do you want to do this? What problems it solve? And they need to tell us it needs to be their idea. And then we're going to come around and put our capes on and, and help them. Um, I think to the, you know, the rest of the industry, you know, if you think about it, you know, a T, everyone's got a TMS, you know, they, they do, they have one, they're doing it some way, shape or form. So to go in and try and sell a big global TMS project, you know, those days in some ways are gone too. And it's like, Hey, why do you go? You don't need to go and invest in a buffet when all you want is salad, no dressing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one of the things that we need know, a t-shirt printing machine. I got, it, dude. <laughs> I got them coming, man. <laughs> but at TMS data, it's 25 to 50% of your spend. And so it's, uh Oh, that's based off of that. And how do you measure and monitor you know, your decisions, you know, or your models when it's based off of that. And so it's like, I'm excited to bring all that data together. Uh, you know, all this data lake stuff, you know, we were at the lake, you know, two weekends ago and my cousin-in-law said, Hey, so what do you guys do? And um, it was in a lake called the Watson Lake in Northern Arizona. Oh, and yeah. you, you can't swim in it because it's got too much mercury. And I'm like, man, how do I explain this to him? He's a firefighter in Louisiana. So I'm like, we're kayaking through it. And I'm going, you know what? See all this crap every time we're, you know, canoeing and kayaking and we take a stroke and you know, there's crap on, you know, the end. You can't, you don't, can't see where you're going. And we basically just clean all that up, make it swimmable where you know where you're going. Um, you, you know where, you know, you can go to, you can jump in and see what's going on and, and quickly identify, you know, if there's a shark around or, you know, if someone says, hey, what's around the corner, you can dive in and look at it. And in some ways, I'm like, that's kind of what we do. We just clear all this up and make it usable uh, lake so that you can leverage it. And I think, you know, the industry has been waiting for a, a time to value of 90 days or less. 
and the days of going and having to ask for capital, um, you know, of, of millions of dollars of projects to go deliver no ROI is done. And, um, uh, they're looking for trusted partners and that's, you know, what I get excited about is that, you know, Tim's got a, a, a an awesome, um, uh, He's very, you know, he's got a credible, uh, you know, presence in this industry. Uh, people respect him. And uh, in the same way, we have a lot of, you know, 380 plus customers that, you know, are looking for a way to impact more. And so I, I just, we get excited about what's to come. Uh, you know, we have a webinar coming up October 6th, uh, too, that, that's exciting. Let's talk about uh, that for a second. Uh, yeah. y'all, y'all both mentioned control towers earlier in the conversation and i gotta tell you uh building a control tower in 30 days or less is impressive uh so tim and nate let's talk about what folks are going to learn on, on, on that webinar so tim you want to start yeah Mike. sure ab 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 absolutely and nate you can uh please please feel free to add so you know, what I'd like to accomplish or, or for web, the webinar is people to, you know, to understand is, you know, if you talk to any customer, um, you know, they have unique requirements and they'll tell you again and again that we're, we're unique in our requirements. And I think there's, there's some underlying truth to that, right? The way that they do um, in build. And, you know, unfortunately, I think the market has kind of tried to put all of customers in, into a box, right? So you think about the large ERPs and, you know, here's, here's how we're going to do it. And you're going to conform. If you want to change, it's going to be a customization that's going to take X amount of time. So everything that we do, how do we shrink, as Nate said, shrink down that time frame? Well, it starts with, okay, well, what KPIs are, are we defining? So we're going to select, you know, you know, 10, you know, call it five to 10 of their key KPIs, understand upfront before we even get in the door, how they, how they're calculated, how they, how they measure those, what systems we, you know, we go on, go after, um, and then come up with a very succinct strategy to move that onto, you know, a consolidated front and layer in all of the freight data that Nate's team already gets from, from those carriers, right? Um, that they can um, get direct from, from, you know, from, from the source with, of course, the, the customer's permission and really just start going and be clear that, hey, guys, at the end of 30 days or an extended 90 days, you're, you're going to get more than just a, a PowerPoint presentation from us uh, that tells you what you should do. You're going to have a, a living, breathing um, solution um, that you can get started with, right? And it's, it's bite small too fast. What can we get? Are we going to get every single KPI that we, you know, that we can possibly do and every, every source in 30? No, of course not. Cause it's, cause if you're a company, you're always going to be growing and changing, but what you want is to give them, um, enough value to be able to start making decisions, you know, across, um, you know, across their disparate data so they can kind of see, you know, how, how we can get value that that quickly, which I think will be will be industry um, changing. Yeah, I mean, th th what I would add to that is just around, you know, the three buckets of cost, service, and cash. And it's like, hey, where where are you focused? You know, everyone's trying to build these data lakes. They've been doing it for months and months and months and years, and they've invested so much time and energy and money. And it's like, hey, look, you're a retailer. Stick to making clothes. You know, or you're a manufacturer of pool supplies. Man, just stick to pumps. You know, like mm -hmm. don't. And it's like, hey, we've outsourced this. And what they realize is you absolutely can go do this on your own. It's very expensive. And now with, you know, cloud services, you know, it's, it makes it a little cheaper, but it's the maintenance of it all. It's like mm -hmm. things change, you know, a rate change, you know, and it's like, hey, where are you going to update that? And it's got to be updated in all these places and all that impacts this. So for us, you know, the way that we go and integrate to carriers, um, I mean, I think, you know, this morning we had a, just, I'm thinking of a, a customer in my head, just that, that kind of goes to potential this partnership, but, you know, they've been struggling with real-time track and trace and connecting mm -hmm. to carriers and data quality issues and invoice side. And what took nine months um, to go and, and try to figure out and spend a lot of money on, you know, it's taken us, what, four business days to go connect to these carriers. And we've already showed them, hey, this is how we can go fix these data quality issues. And so it, it let's face an integration. quality issues as you know Tim's talked about and what we've talked about is we're going to go and integrate this data we're going to help you know be able to point some you know things out 
um, turn on some KPIs and kind of point them in the right direction. But uh, we can absolutely light these things up uh, very quickly and um, they can keep focusing on strategy and how they can impact the business versus getting so close to doing it. And then when they go do it, the data is out of date and then they got to go read, you know, do it all, all over again. And they still are, you know, have that, you know, garbage in garbage out mm. mentality. Got to let the experts be the experts, right? And, yeah. and you can move a lot faster. Greg, I know you got to come in here. So many. Um, one, Tim, congratulations. You added from last week. I know we're crediting you for last week, but you added your t-shirtism. Bite small, chew, chew fast. Yes. Uh, I wanted to stop you when you said, so, and I, but you were grooving, so I didn't want to mess that up. <laughs> but I want to repeat. You will have more than a PowerPoint in 30 days, right? <laughs> we'll have a resolution. And I think that is important. That, that needs to be said frequently and loudly and repeatedly because that is the difference in what, in what this partnership and cloud solutions and um, modern technology can and does deliver versus the old way more than a powerpoint in 30 days <laughs> well i think to that point greg <laughs> man i wish i had things, thought of that when i was still in there. <laughs> it's one of the things that's frustrating you know from our side you know we're not you know we got an aim rate links we've been around since 02 never needed dc money and it's like tim's you know it's like hey we're you know one of my favorite movies of all time is hoosiers you know and it's i love those you know it's like hey you don't count on them but man they are gonna rise to the occasion and they're gonna deliver and it's like these um, Cinderella stories. And I, I think the, you know, the whole thing, like, you know, with us, you know, a lot of guys probably think, you know, I can't get fired if I go choose them, mate. It's like, yeah, but you can hit your bonus, you know, and measure and monitor if you, you know, choose this Agilinx thing. And I think that, you know, people will realize uh, what's taken them years. It can be sped up and now they can go focus on it. But, uh, you know, the other teacher thing, which, you know, that drowning in data and starving f for information is one. And then the other one um, is, you know, with data quality, you can now digitize, you know, you can digitize the decision making. And I think there's just so much good stuff that comes from uh, the potential partnership, you know, the partnership itself and the potential opportunities that customers have to, to actually do something instead of just resting, investing, because those days I think are, are long gone. Well put. Well put. All right. Well, especially now, those kind of things have been exposed. Look, Amen. you may not lose your job by picking, you know, big player X, but you could lose your company, and it's happened plenty. Yeah, absolutely. So, so October, so October sixth for the webinar. I'm gonna make sure that we're real clear on that. We're gonna yeah. include the direct registration link in the show notes of the episode. Come learn from the folks that are doing it. Uh, how to stand up a control tower in less than 30 days and get more than a PowerPoint, as, as Greg said. Love that. Hoorah. Um, and Greg, uh, well, let's make sure our audience knows how to connect with Tim and Nate and their respective organizations. You or just keep listening here. And <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tim, t guys, tell us how, how folks can connect with you. Yeah, and it's a great question. And, and, you know, and I know it's normal to send to the website. It, my goal over the next, you know, several months, too, is to make our, our website much more of an interactive. Um, and I, I love what you guys are doing, um, you know, with supply chain now and, and going for getting material and video and, and easily searchable. I'd like to kind of give that uh, a similar type experience to to our customer base and make it a place where they can go and, and and pose questions about control towers and digital twin right there's so much noise and confusion so mm. a long answer but but our website will be good and, and you have my commitment it'll be it'll be more interactive um, as we move forward we just launched a, a forum for that and then the other thing is I think the the whole demo market and you know as you mentioned Greg powerpoints um, are great but I don't think people have the attention span to look through a 90 you know, a 90 slide deck anymore, right? So how do we put examples right on our website so you can go and, and click on the da on dashboards, get a look and feel of how everything's working and how it would work for your business, I think is, is going to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a good thing. So website and LinkedIn, you know, at Agilitics, um, you know, on all social media, but LinkedIn is probably where we're most active. You on LinkedIn as well, Tim? Yes. 
Yeah. Oh, and me personally. Yeah. Sorry, Tim. Tim. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. Uh, it's the Justin. toughest question in the world, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. I, I it love, is. Tim, I love how you talk about, you know, really engaging folks that reach out and, and it sounds like you're all willing to compare notes and have those whiteboard discussions and just talk practitioner to practitioner, which is, is so valuable. Um, it always has been, but, but cool. these days, especially with it's everyone's kind of, there's less access folks, you know, there's not the events, you know, you can't, it, there's less avenues for that. So I, I love yeah. that approach there. All cool. right, Nate, let's make sure folks can connect with you and with rate links. Absolutely. You can find me on LinkedIn, connect, love to connect. Uh, we're always one or two connections away. I think from anybody in this industry, it's a small industry, but a, a big world. Um, and for rate links as well, we have a LinkedIn come follow us, um, and get the, uh, what we could just kind of our take and our blogs and our vlogs and everything that we're putting out there. And then our website, www.ratelinks.com. And, um, links with there's an a lot X, of, right? right. Rate links to the next. And there's a lot of opportunities to just do connect with us, talk to a pro, uh, do some free analysis, but, um, Absolutely, we are there and looking forward to connect. Wonderful, wonderful. Greg, I, I tell you, this conversation here, uh, you could power a city block with the amount of passion uh, from these two gentlemen in this episode, right? Yeah, I, I think um, what's really powerful about this is the transformation there. I said it, okay, bingo. Um, it is, it is the power of transformation here. It's the power of the wealth of data and, and a mechanism to, uh, build it. And we're not talking about rookies here either, right? This is a new age solution by, by two professionals who, two groups of professionals who've been in the industry for a while. They get it. And they also get the new age of data and solutions. And that's a rare rare combination. You have so many companies that have the kind of level of experience that all of us here have that are stuck in the past. And the, these groups see the future. They're building the future. They're doing it right now. And that is incredibly powerful stuff. So, um, you know, rate links, right? Only took them 18 years to become an overnight success, right? That's not uncommon, in fact. Yeah. So uh, it's funny because Nate, I, I heard that several times um, around, I don't know, 2014, 2017. Man, you guys are an overnight success. I'm like, yep, just nine years to overnight success, right? Yep. It's yeah. funny how long it takes to build that. And by the way, yeah. if you ever doubt that, look at how long some companies were around. Oh, yeah. We learned about them, Uber. And mm, yeah. So oh. great work, good sustained um, solutions, experienced professionals with a a future vision. It's brilliant. Yep. Love it. All right. So let want to thank uh, Tim and Nate, Tim judge, president CEO of Agilytics and Nate Endicott, senior vice president of global sales and alliances at rate links. Another great discussion as much fun as we have with the live stream really enjoyed this deeper dive here, uh, Tim and Nate. Thanks so much for your time here today. Thanks. You too, Scott. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Thanks guys. Thanks yeah. guys. All right. So, hey, uh, to our audience, hopefully you enjoyed this conversation with these gentlemen as much as we have. Don't forget the October 6th webinar. Yeah, uh, We'll include that link, make it easy. Greg, uh, you get the final word before we sign off here. Well, first of all, Tim, Tim's office is near one of my favorite barbecue restaurants on the planet. <laughs> um, and Nate is from, is in my wife's hometown. So um, I'm going to go visit these guys at some point. Uh, look, this is, as I said, this is a really important thing. We're breaking through in an industry that desperately needs it. We're breaking down silos. Um, Nate said it well early on, right? Stay in your lane, know what your gifts are. And that is true. And, and I'm sure that they are seeing, like so many of us across the industry are seeing that retailers and other shippers, they are staying in their lane. They know what they're good at. They're good at merchandising and sales and marketing and assessing the consumer. And they're letting other organizations handle those aspects of the business that really need deep, deep expertise. And they're doing it with solutions that are much, much easier and quicker and more reliable to implement and grow on. Well put, as always. And hey, 
freight audit is dead. And if you have any questions around that, reach out to Tim and Nate, and they'll explain exactly why and why it should be. This so, episode needs its own merch. That's right. You know? <laughs> Let's do it. Hey, we can do it. <laughs> to our audience, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, gosh, so much, uh, so many t-shirtisms, but more importantly, so much thought and um, been there, done that right yeah. here. As Greg says, the future is now. And so hopefully you enjoy the conversations as much as we have. On behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, including Greg White, this is Scott Luton. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, find us and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. Hey, do good, give forward, and be the change that's needed. And on that note, we'll see you next time here on Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody.